Okay. So uh, as Pete was saying, uh, we had a session at the uh, Society for Historic Society for American Archaeology conference in Orlando in Disney World, which was a very bizarre place to have an archaeological conference. Running around with Mickey and Minnie and Pocahontas, and I guess we're going to have some photographs too of Cinderella later on. Um, in our session, we only had about ten people because has anybody been to a Society for American Archaeology conference before? They're rather small, like we had three thousand people with fifteen concurrent sessions. So we were competing against all those folks. So I guess that's the reason why we had less. So that was the beginning of discussions in terms of establishing a relationship and partnership. So. Uh, as president of the Registered Professional Archaeologist, this was a great opportunity to come here to learn more about CIFA and how things are done here in the UK. But we kind of started that at the SAA conference. Uh, they have a huge exhibit hall. They have lots of uh, people selling books. University of Leicester was there selling all their wares and talking about their online program, et cetera, et cetera. And the Registered Professional Archaeologist had our own booth because we have an association with uh, the Society for uh, American Archaeology. But CIFA wanted to also have their booth, but the price for having an exhibit was outrageously expensive. So I had to sneak in CIFA in the dark of night so they can put up their little banner next to ours. And so there's Pete with her banner, and then there's me and a woman who's uh, on our board of directors. And we have EAA on the one side, and we have the Society for Historic Archaeology. We had their conference here in Leicester, a few years ago. So we've started our partnership, I think, by sneaking you all in. So you didn't have to pay the $1,000 US to get in. So we've, so I'm here to kind of continue the discussion and to learn. And already, I've learned so much in terms of how CIFA operates, how you do things here in the UK. And I'm going to take that back home to the US to figure out how we can do a better job within the Registered Professional Archaeologists because we're kind of growing and changing. So given that, let me just talk about what is the Register for Professional Archaeologists. <clears throat> the Register is basically a listing of archaeologists who voluntarily state that they're going to abide by a set of code of conduct and uh, standards of research performance. Uh, Registered Professional Archaeologists, or RPAs for short, to become an, a Registered Professional Archaeologist in the US, you have to have a graduate degree in archaeology, anthropology, history, or related field. Uh, and you have to do either a master's thesis or a dissertation that demonstrates you are able to do high-powered, high-level archaeological research to address archaeological issues. So if you basically have that degree and have that piece of paper, a dissertation or a master's thesis that demonstrates your ability to do high-level archaeological research, that's all you need to do, become a registered professional archaeologist or an RPA, which is very different from the accreditation process in CIFA. And there's a basically a history we can talk about later in terms of why we do that. Also, unlike CIFA, <clears throat> we don't have a paid staff. So you have like 10 folks on your staff. You have Pete, who's the uh, direct, executive director of the organization. RPA uh, is a, almost a totally voluntary organization. Uh, I'm the president. I was elected by the, all the registered professional archaeologists in the nation. So I had to compete against somebody to get this position. Uh, and our board also has other kinds of positions. Mike is our grievance coordinator elect. So he was elected to that through a national uh, election process. So that's how we basically are established in terms of our board and my position as president. We have a business office who handles the financials, the paperwork, the running of the organization. So, and then we also have these committees to do various things. We have a committee on continuing professional, we call it education, CPEs. We have a committee to do that. We have a certification program for field schools. We have an advisory committee to help deal with grievances. Someone who breaks the code uh, of conduct or the standards of research performance. And these are all voluntary committees. So basically, we're a very different kind of organization. And I'm kind of jealous of CIFA. So we'll talk more about where that's going to lead in the future. So that is uh, kind of how we're structured. And the primary purpose, very similar to CIFA, uh, of the register, is to promote, in the United States, professionalism and ethical behavior. The majority of RPAs, registered professional archaeologists, are within the United States 
We do have folks in other parts of the world, mostly from Canada. We have a few in Peru. There's a, uh, in fact, uh, Jerry is also an RPA, so he has two hats there. Um, so, but we're mostly for the United States, and we're a voluntary organization to promote uh, this ethical behavior and professionalism within the archaeological discipline in the United States. Uh, the register, when it was set up, was done in partnership with four organizations in the United States. So these are, are what we call our sponsoring organizations. And they include the Society for American Archaeology, which has around 10,000 members, uh, the Society for Historic Archaeology, uh, the American Anthropological Association, which is a huge organization that includes mostly cultural anthropologists, and they have an archaeological division of about 700 members, uh, and then the Archaeological Institute of America. So these four sponsoring organizations got together with the register to, to kind of fund us. So they each provided an initial contribution to the register, so we have a financial uh, pinning. At the beginning, each of them provided around 10,000 US dollars to start the register, and then that has decreased over time as our war chest has increased. Um, because they have a financial connection with the register, each of these organizations have a, has a seat on our board of directors. Uh, and also, as being sponsoring agencies, they also uh, promote the register. They want their members to become RPAs. And they have also signed on to, in writing, to our code of conduct and our standards of research performance. So that's kind of what the register is all set up and how we're organized. Now, before I talk more about our code of conduct and our standards of research performance and what we do, I want to spend some time in terms of the context in which most archaeologists in the United States work, which is in terms of a federal historic preservation process. So I'm going to take you through a quick trip about uh, laws in the United States that deal with archaeological protection. And I teach this thing, class about this in three days. So I'm going to give you a three-day thing in about five minutes. So here we go. So um, in the US, on the top is basically federal laws. <clears throat> and there's three primary federal laws I'm going to talk about in a little more detail. The National Historic Preservation Act, uh, which was passed in 1966, is our primary historic preservation law. Uh, in the US, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And of course, in the US, unlike here, we have indigenous folks. We have uh, tribes or Indians, depending on where you but I'll be using the words tribes for them. And they have special status within the United States. Tribes in the US are, by law, considered domestic dependent nations within the United States. So it's having like England and France within the United States, with the United States watching them and working with them. So they have a legal status within the United States with the US federal government. And we have laws that relate to their history, their culture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have these three main laws, and we also have states uh, have archaeological laws also. Uh, they're not as strong as the three top federal laws. Uh, they don't have a lot of teeth. <clears throat> Uh, and they are kind of like mini versions of the National Historic Preservation Act. Uh, and we also have some local archaeological ordinances within counties and cities. So I think it's like the reverse of what you have here in England, where I guess the counties are kind of the seat of where archaeology happens because of planning. In ours, it's at the national level, it's the federal level. When you get further down, the laws become weaker and weaker and weaker, and particularly local laws uh, like if I'm a developer and I want to get a uh, permit from a county or a city, if they have an archaeological ordinance, I have to do an archaeological impact analysis and evaluate the significance of what I find and then how am I going to deal with it before I do my development. In some cases, in some cities and counties, the archaeological site has to already be on a list. So they don't look for new ones. So if, it's, if they discover something, you just keep on applying right through it unless it has human remains. Very different kind of process in the United States. So I'm going to focus on the uh, primary historic preservation laws first, the National Historic Preservation Act, which uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary this October. So we're having a national celebration uh, about this law. Um, so what this law has, does is basically is the federal program for preserving places of significance. And our measure for places of significance is the National Register of Historic Places. So this is a 
Uh, the National Register is kind of an honor roll of the most significant places in the United States, but also it's used as a planning tool. Uh, because what, under federal law, what you are going to protect or take into account as a result of federal actions is those things that are on or eligible for listing in the National Register. And these properties have to meet certain criteria. And they include archaeological sites, historic buildings, historic districts, and also places of religious and cultural significance to tribes. So there's the whole range of properties that get listed on the National Register. The Act also established what's called the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. The Advisory Council is our lead federal uh, preservation agency. They advise the President and Congress about preservation issues. And most importantly, in terms of archaeology and working as archaeologists in the United States, the Advisory Council manages Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So I'm going to spend a little time on that section of the law because that's the reason why a lot of us have work in the United States because of this one section of the law. And I'm going to talk about Section 106. Uh, again, Section 106 is the primary reason why archaeological work is done in the country because of these federal mandates. And most archaeologists are employed in the United States because of Section 106. And what Section 106 does, it requires a federal agency, uh, Department of Defense, uh, Federal Highway Administration, any other federal agency, or an applicant who needs a federal permit, license, or approval to do their project to take into account the effects of these actions on places that are on the National Register or eligible listing in the National Register. So for example, if a state Department of Transportation, every state has a Department of Transportation, wants to build a new highway or bridge, and they're using federal funds, the federal agency that's giving them the funds and the Department of Transportation have to fulfill the requirements of Section 106, which are basically, what is out there? What's the old stuff? Is it significant and eligible listing in the National Register? Are we going to have an effect on it? If we're going to have an effect, how do we resolve that adverse effect? And that's kind of the steps in the process in the Wendell Six. Finding it, evaluating its impacts, and if you are going to have an impact, how do you mitigate those impacts? So that's kind of in a nutshell what 106 is all about. So other kinds of projects, it could be a large energy company who's building a massive solar panel farm, like there's our president, uh, talking about a huge solar panel field outside uh, in the mid, out in the west. This is on federal land, but it's a private company who's building it. So because it's on federal land, the private company needs a permit from the federal agency. The, the private company has to comply with the 106 for the federal agency. That's how that works. Or if you're doing oil and gas drilling, which is a really big deal in the United States, uh, on federal land, you also have to comply with Section 106. And usually, it's the applicant for the permit or license or approval that does the work for the agency, though it's the federal agency's responsibility to make sure it's done correctly. You follow me so far? We good? OK. Um, how this process is done, though it's the federal agency or the applicant doing the work, they do it in consultation with a whole bunch of folks. And the primary aid individual or group that they talk to is a state historic preservation officer. Every state has one of these. And the uh, state historic preservation officers, which are the uh, second bullet, or we call them SHPOs, uh, are, were created by the Act when it was passed in 1966. Every state has got one. And they receive federal funds from the National Park Service. And also they use state funds. And so their role within the Section 106 process is to be the voice of the state. Federal agencies, applicants go to the SHPO to, in consultation in terms of how you're going to implement the 106 process. Uh, if you're going to have an effect, you consult with the SHPO in terms of how you're going to deal with the impacts of your project and resolving those adverse effects. So they have a very, very important role within the process. And then the other bullets are the other parties involved in the consultation process. Uh, federally recognized tribes, uh, very important. You have to consult with them. And if you're on the, on the island of Hawaii, you talk to what's called Native Hawaiian organizations. Uh, the applicant is also a part of the 106 process. So these are the folks who are doing the project, getting the federal permit, funding, or licenses or approvals. Local governments, where the project is, they're also consulted as part of the process. 
and then anybody else of the public who has a demonstrated interest in the outcomes of the project, both in terms of historic preservation issues or the economic issues, and the public. The public's involved throughout the process, and when you go into, you, I'm not going into great detail about it, but you look at the, law, the regulations about 106, there's steps in terms of how the public is to be engaged. And if you're going to have an adverse impact on a place that is listed or eligible listing in the National Register, you involve the Advisory Council. And they're in Washington, D.C., and they'll come involved and they'll bollocks up your project, which they often do, <laughs> but I didn't say it. I have friends over there. They're good people. But they consult. So they're looking at the, the impact from the national level in terms of what to deal with. Though you do consult, the federal agency or the applicant consults with all these people, the federal agency makes the final decision. That's why they're on the top of the list. So throughout this consultation process, the federal agency is the group that makes the decision in terms of what has to happen, whether uh, what the impacts are going to be and how to resolve the impacts. No one can tell the federal agency what to do, so they make the ultimate decision-making process. So basically, Section 106 is a process. If, if a, someone wants to stop a project to say you did 106 wrong, they look at the process, not the outcome. Uh, the outcome is totally up to the federal agency through this consultation process. Okay, so that's section 106. And then I'm going to move on quickly to the other two laws. The Archaeological Resources Protection Act and the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, the Archaeological Resource Protection Act um, is for a requirement that if you do archaeological investigations on federal lands or tribal lands, you have to get a permit from the appropriate federal agency or the tribe. Also, the, this act has penalties if you dig without a permit or you vandalize and loot. That becomes a federal offense and you could be taken to jail. They'll take away your shovels, your metal detectors, your cars, your home, your children, everything. Okay? So there's a, a very strong protection of archaeological resources uh, on federal land, and that's what um, the ARPA, the first one, is, is all about. So. As an archaeologist, if you're going to work on federal land, you have to get the, the permit before you do your digging. Then there's the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act. And this came out as a result of all these museums having all these human remains associated with the Indians. They got really upset and they lobbied Congress and saying, you've got our ancestors on display in your museums or you got them in boxes in, the, in your archives. So this was a, a way of getting these materials back to the tribes to repatriate them. So any agency or museum that holds Native American human remains, funerary objects, or objects of cultural patrimony has to consult with the tribes who are culturally affiliated or lineal descent with those materials to determine their final disposition. And the tribes decides and tells the agency how they're to, dispo to be disposed. Either stay in the museum, come back to the tribe, get reburied. Okay, so it's up to the tribes. And if you're on Hawaii, the Native Hawaiian organizations are the ones you consult with. So as an archaeologist, if you're working on federal land and you find Native American human remains, or you're on Hawaii and you find Native Hawaiian human remains, you have to consult with these groups and figure out how you're going to repatriate and finally end up with these materials, which is they may go to a museum, they may be studied, they may not be studied at all because the tribe or the Native Hawaiians don't want it, and then it goes back to them and they'll do whatever they need to do based on their own cultural practices. So those are the primary laws that deal with archaeology in the US, that most archaeologists do it. In terms of government mandated standards, <clears throat> it's not about professional standards, there's two types of standards. The first one, I'll read the Secretary of Interior's Historic Preservation Professional Qualification Standards. Uh, the Secretary of Standards are for archaeologists working on federally funded projects or on federal land. You have to meet these standards. And these standards are basically, uh, you have to have a graduate degree in archaeology, anthropology, history, a related field, and have management experience. It doesn't say how much, but you have to have management experience. Then we have the Office of Personnel Management, Individual Occupational Requirements for Archaeological Series, comma, 0193. You can't get more bureaucratic than that. So o OMP, Office of P Personnel Management, that's for an archaeologist who's hired by the federal government. So that's the requirement to be hired by the federal <coughs> government. You have to have these qualifications. You don't have to have a degree in archaeology to be a federal archaeologist. You don't have to have any degree at all. 
All you need are four years of archaeological experience. So there's a difference here in terms of these two requirements. Some agencies within the federal government have their own requirements in terms of qualifications to work on their federal mandated lands. And those are usually much more strict than the Secretary of Interior Standards or the Office of Personnel Management. Oftentimes you have to know the history, the culture in a certain area within the land, like the Bureau of Land Management, which is out in the West, you need to know the history and the archaeology and demonstrate you've done work in that one area to be able to get a permit to do work in that area. So that's the, the standards that we have to deal with. Okay, so enough of laws, regulations, and standards, and now we're going to get to the Register of Professional Archaeologists. So I'm going to go through, and these will be very familiar. How many folks are CIFA members here? Okay, so this is going to be very familiar. Uh, we've compared the, and contrast our code of conduct and our standards for research performance. So these are the tools, like CIFA, that we use for promoting professional behavior and high research standards within the U.S. We have a code of conduct, just like you have with CIFA, and the, and the language is very, very similar. It's structured differently. We have a lot of an archaeologist shall and shall not, and it's broken down by who you're interacting with. So we have a code of conduct related to dealing with the public, dealing with students, dealing with your peers, dealing with employers, dealing with your clients, dealing with the government. So it's kind of broken down very, very differently, but it's very, very similar in terms of the key elements. Then we have standards of research performance. So it's basically lay out how you're supposed to do your research. That you have to have a good research design, you have to do, use appropriate field methodology, you have to have appropriate records, you have to disseminate the results of your research within a set time, which is, I think, the same time period, 10 years, or someone else who's an RPA can take your data and publish it themselves. When I, we looked at, I think yesterday we were in a session, we compared uh, CIFA's standards for research performance, the standards for performance and research, and ours are much, more, much shorter. Yours go on for page, pages. And the reason why, in the US, every state historic preservation officer within has their own state guidelines. So that's what we use, as opposed to having it in our code. So that's a little bit different there. So we have standards of research performance, code of conduct. <clears throat> we also have continuing professional education, uh, which you call continuing professional developments. Um, we don't, re to be an RPA, you, you up, re-up your registration every year. You don't have to have continuing professional education. It's not required yet. We're, hopefully we're going to get there. But we promote it and we provide uh, as a service to uh, our RPAs uh, which courses you should take. So we certify various trainings around the nation. And they can be webinars, uh, classes, et cetera, uh, just at our, or sessions at meetings where you learn new skills. Um, so we certify them through a certification program uh, with the idea that these training opportunities promote uh, our ethical standards and our standards for research performance as registers of professional archaeologists. And we also certify field schools. Uh, we do this because we feel that for young folks that this is a very important career path. So we uh, certify a field school and in fact when we get the money from the four organizations that support us, we give them a thousand dollars back and they can then use that thousand dollars as a scholarship to students within their certified field school. So they, we're giving something back to the students that way. Okay, like CIFA, we have what we call a grievance process. Uh, so that if someone breaks the code of conduct or does really bad research and, break, and doesn't follow the standards for research performance, anybody, an, a registered professional archeologist or any member of the public can then file a formal grievance against that RPA. Uh, and then there's a process in terms of how we deal with it. So we have a, a grievance coordinator, Mike's going to be the next grievance coordinator in a few years, um, who takes on these cases. We get about 10 cases a year. And most of the cases are handled by the grievance coordinator kind of doing uh, as an intermediary between the opposing parties, the, the people who are making the accusation and the accusee. So they usually kind of work it out. But in some cases, it goes on to the actual disciplinary process. And if we go through the disciplinary process, there are different uh, scales in terms of what will happen to you based on how bad you really screw up. So there's uh, an admonishment, censure, 
suspension and an outright termination that you can no longer be a registered professional archaeologist, so you get terminated. And here's some of the examples of, of cases we've had. Uh, representing yourself as an RPA, putting RPA after your name, and you're not. That's very, very common. Uh, using false job titles on your CV or other documents. We've had cases where someone says I was the project principal and they were only the crew chief, things like that. Uh, taking artifacts from federal land, which is a federal offense, but then also you're in violation of RPA's code of conduct. And plagiarism. Uh, we had a very, very big case about that one, which that case in particular was the last one, which I stole this one from Pete, which I want to add to our code of conduct, which is doing something really stupid. <laughs> this guy plagiarized a whole bunch of reports, and the people who reviewed it at the State Historic Preservation Office were one of the authors of one of those reports that were plagiarized. <laughs> so that gentleman did something really stupid. So I'm going to add that in, so I want to thank you, Pete, for that one. Okay, now here's an area where we're very different from... CIFA, we do not get involved in politics or advocacy unless the issue relates to uh, an attack on archaeological professionalism or ethics. So if Congress, which they try to do all the time, do really stupid stuff to gut the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act or other historic preservation laws, which because we have a, I can say this here, because we have a republic in Congress, they try to do on a regular basis because archaeology gets in the way of development and they want to gut the laws and restrict the president's ability to do historic preservation. Um, Society for American Archaeology, Society for Historic Archaeology, um, the American Cultural Resource Association, and other preservation partners within those groups, those are the, are the agents for defending historic preservation and archaeology in the United States. RPA does not do that because we're basically you know, focusing on professionalism and also uh, ethical behavior. However, just last week, we kind of stepped our toe into the political arena. And this was very interesting, I'll mention this case, where one of our sponsors, the American Anthropological Association, was passed a resolution which was voted on, starting to be voted on last Friday, to boycott Israeli academic institutions. So basically, if you are a member of the American Anthropological Association, you cannot work with, share information, or if they ask you for information, with an Israeli institution. So this was the resolution that they're now voting on as we speak. So then it came to our attention, so we were asked, does if a, a, a member of the American Anthropological Association, who's also an RPA, implements this resolution, this boycott, would they be in violation of code of conduct? And the answer was yes. So I had to write a letter to the president of AAA and send it out to all the registered professional archaeologists saying, we're, we're not saying vote or don't vote, but if you do this, you may be in violation of the, our code of conduct and someone can file a grievance against you. So it'll be interesting to see whether we have any influence on the vote. So that was our first real step into politics because it was basically a political decision by a group within that, the association. Okay. Now for the numbers. Uh, the register has 2,909 registered professional archaeologists. Uh, the majority of these folks, as I said, work within the private sector. Thank you. Oh, I'm running out of time. OK. We'll keep my eye. OK. Uh, our, I'm almost out here. We'll um, uh, work in the private sector. About 18% of RPAs work for the government or uh, institutions within uh, academia or with the federal government. We also have uh, 37 certified professional education programs and since our program uh, started in 2013 we now have 13 certified field schools. So um, the number of archaeologists has really grown over the years. Uh, we have expanded. Uh, I wish we had a chart like Pete showed uh, at the opening session but it also has gone up and we also are now affiliating ourselves with state archaeological societies. So they can become affiliated with the organization. Their members get the benefits of being an RPA, and that's a program that is really growing. So I'll ask the question then, who are today's RPAs? Uh, the majority of them, not surprisingly, are very young people. Folks are coming out with a master's degree who see becoming an RPA as a part of their career path. In fact, I, I heard from one student that there's a cachet to being an RPA, which I thought was really kind of cool. And the credit to this goes to uh, the professors who promote RPA and actually teach ethics and professionalism 
to their archaeological students. And uh, the, we have one university, the University of East Carolina, which has a very good underwater archaeology program, which has consistently produced the most uh, mas new masters who then become RPAs. And they're all underwater archaeologists. And they're a real crazy bunch, as you can see from the photograph. And I think that's because of their breathing all that compressed air all the time. But um, so they are uh, really into RPA. They understand ethical professionals. And there's like five universities. and we kind of have a race going between these universities in terms of who can produce the most. And we put that on our website. So what's next? Last slide. Um, what we're planning to do in 2016 and going forward is uh, we need to make the business case of why the federal government and applicants who have to comply with federal laws should hire an RPA. We have not done that in the United States. So I'm going to steal your brochure. And we're going to use that in the United States. We're also going to be begin to look at what ethical and professional issues we need to deal with in the United States. And that's also something we're looking into. And as Pete said at the beginning, we want to build this partnership with CIFA. Um, because we can see that, that we're kind of a very different kind of organization. I think we want to become more like CIFA. And I've learned a lot in terms of how CIFA operates. And then we're going to talk about partnerships of where we're going to go. So I'm going to be able to take a lot of this information back to the United States, work with my board to decide where can RPA go based on the experiences, Sifa, and how you do things in the UK. Thank you. <laughs>